If you go to a doctor, you want an accurate diagnosis. But even if the diagnosis is correct, it's worthless and in fact dangerous if that same doctor prescribes the wrong medication or surgery to fix it. The Zeitgeist Movement, or Venus Project, led by Peter Joseph, has amassed a following that really can't be ignored anymore. Um, these are people with good intentions, people who really want to save the world, but like that misguided doctor, the solution that they offer would lead to disaster if they ever had the chance to implement it on a large scale. In the newest film, Zeitgeist Moving Forward, there's a fairly accurate and thought-provoking description of the current state of affairs on our planet. And its assessment of the pitfalls of our current economic and monetary systems are lucid and, and well thought out. And even the basic idea of an economy based on resources rather than financial instruments and debt is sound. However, full implementation of the resource-based economy would end very, very badly. The resource-based economy promoted by Zeitgeist proposes setting up a global production management system, a global demand distribution tracking system, and a global resource management system, all controlled by computers. It also promotes the idea of largely eliminating private ownership and replacing it with an idea that they call strategic access. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go into the myriad of ways that such a system could and would be abused by those so inclined. I'll leave that for a subject for another video. Instead, I'm going to ask you a question, and all I want is your honest answer. Now, I understand you want to change the world to match the resource-based economy model. But do I have the right to disagree with you? You see, I don't want to live in a world where all the resources are controlled by computers. I don't want to live in a world where all cities are planned in advance and they're all circular. And I don't want to live in a world of enforced equality. So in your perfect world, in your perfect resource-based economy, what would you do with people like me? What are you going to do with people who don't want to go along with your vision, who don't want to live in a resource-based economy? What are you going to do with the people who own businesses and don't want to give them up and who don't want to switch to a voluntary product exchange system? I don't want to work for people I don't know for free, and I'm not the only one. Are you going to force us? Are you going to exclude us from the rest of society? For those who don't want to give up their property, will you just take it? I'm not ignorant to what you have to offer. I just don't want it, and I'll never want it. And if you want me or millions of other people like me to comply, then you're going to have to do it by physical force. Now, if you're part of this movement and you're serious and you haven't taken this into consideration, that's a recipe for disaster. Because unless your movement is very well armed and willing to do away with millions of people, then you will completely and utterly fail. Now, Peter Joseph of the Zeitgeist Movement has never called for violence or coercion, and I've never accused him of calling for violence and coercion. However, if his followers ever get the chance to put the philosophy that he advocates into action, it will lead to violence. Now, in order to understand why, you have to take a good, hard, honest look at property rights. Now, the obvious problem which arises when you look at their prescription, which calls for 100% control of the world's resources, is that those resources are on land, and that land is owned by people. Now, the underlying question, which should be very obvious, I keep proposing to people in the comment section, what do you do to the people who don't want to actually give up their property? Whether that property is land, factories, or any other kind of infrastructure. Now, most people try to skirt around the issue, but I got a couple comments that were actually pretty honest. Now, this comment was posted by Evil Genius 747 and he answers, what about the people who want to keep the land for themselves? And in big capital letters he writes, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Now, I'm going to gloss over the fact that this is a quote from a science fiction series, and I'm going to jump right into the implications of what this guy is actually saying. Now, what you're making really clear here is that you don't care about property rights, and that if you want something, you're going to come and take it, because you're with the many, and I'm with the few, and you got needs. Now, if you really can't see how this would lead to violence, then maybe you should come to Texas and give it a little trial run. And there was another comment posted by World Watch 100, which makes it ever so clear what's at stake here. And he writes, Unfortunately, people like you will be forced to participate in a resource-based economy, the same way that billions of people are forced to participate in a deadly monetary system. All right, now that we got it out in the open, how? How are you going to force me to comply? You guys are going to face armed resistance. So are you going to build an army? Do you have the guts to pull the trigger? Because that's what it's going to take. And you do realize if it comes to that, then your whole idea of being a nonviolent voluntary society is out the window. You will have just created a violent totalitarian dictatorship of epic proportions. Now, it seems to me that you guys have the impression that this is going to have a better outcome if it all goes down after rule of law is gone. And I actually have a comment here that was posted on a video which pretty clearly illustrates that perspective. And this was posted by World at Large 77. And he says, you obviously don't get the point of the documentary. If 
people don't give up their ideas of ownership and don't feel like converting to a more singular and community-based world, your opinion won't even exist because you'll be dead. This species is doing a pretty shitty job of maintaining its future. Now, the fact that you would say something like this in itself is pretty revealing, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and just deal with your argument at face value. Where on earth did you get the idea that you and the Zeitgeist followers are somehow going to survive this cataclysm that's heading our way while people like me who believe in personal liberty and property rights would just be dead. You see, I own farmland. I have heirloom seeds. I've worked on farms. I was raised hunting and fishing. I know how to recognize edible plants. And I have the means and the will to defend my property and my family if it ever comes to that. And I hope it doesn't. So what about you? How prepared are you for what's coming? And I get the impression, based on your comments, that you guys aren't preparing at all. I also get the impression that you wouldn't know how to find or produce food for yourselves in a natural environment. By my calculations, the people who think like me, who take responsibility for their livelihood, are much more likely to survive. The way I see it, if you see this disaster coming and you're doing nothing to get ready for it, then that's just irresponsible. And if you think you're going to get by by just taking from other people what they've accumulated during this time that they're preparing, then that's criminal. The thing is, a scenario like that will lead to violence whether you say you want violence or not. And if it's you that's walking onto someone's land with the intention of taking it, then you really don't have much room to complain when you end up getting shot. And really, I'm doing you guys a favor by telling you this, because that's how it would end. You may not care about property rights, but you're not the one with the property. Now, there's a pretty common response that people keep coming back to me with in the personal messages and the comments. And I have a pretty good example of it right here in this comment that was posted by Colleen FR. And she says, question is, why would you not want to live in a resource-based economy? Then we can continue our conversation. No, 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 no. Someone you don't know walks up to you, asks you for the keys to your car. You say no, and then they demand an explanation? Quite frankly, I'm astounded that you would think that that's a tenable position. No one should have to justify why they don't want the fruits of their labor taken from them. That should just be common sense. But you know, common sense seems to be pretty lacking in the religion that the zeitgeist movement has become. Now let's just take a second and review the facts at hand and see how we got here. Fact number one, the resource-based economy calls for and requires 100% control of all the world's resources, production, and distribution. And all this would be run by some kind of supercomputer. Fact number two, the infrastructure that you would need to take control of in order to do this is already owned by somebody else. And to get from point A, which is where we are right now, the point B, which would be this total control system, either somehow magically all of us who don't believe in the zeitgeist vision suddenly die off, leaving you guys behind untouched, or you're going to have to take our land. You're going to have to take our factories. You're going to have to take our mines and our farms, our stores, and even our equipment. And if you don't think that that's going to lead to violence, you're in for a very rude awakening. This is a video response and a challenge to Peter Joseph based on his reply to Stefan Molyneux. Both videos will be linked below, and any and all video responses will be accepted. Now, as I was listening to both sides of this debate, I was first allowing myself to be drawn into the details of each position. But then I took a step back, and I looked at it, and I realized that the key is not in what's being said, but rather in what's being left out. Peter Joseph's argument is delivered as a multiple-choice question. Either A, you support the current system and the paradigm which created it, or B, we move to his resource-based economy with everything that comes with it, including a computerized control grid which will dictate how every square inch of land and resource is utilized. Now, this is a clear example of a false dichotomy, also known as the false dilemma logical fallacy. It should be obvious to everyone that there's more than two choices. Now, just because you haven't heard someone propose the choice that you like is irrelevant. It is still intellectually dishonest and, in fact, dangerous to pretend that you have the one and only way. Now, we both agree that the current system is doomed, so let's not waste time defending a dead horse or accusing me of defending it. This system will most likely collapse in our lifetime. What's at stake is what will grow up or be instituted to replace the current system. My position is this. The system that you propose would not only fall short of the promises that it offers for those that are desperate for hope, but would in fact lead to an even darker and more oppressive system than the one we have right now. And I'm gonna explain why. But before I do, I'm gonna play a short clip just so we're clear where we're starting from. You know, you can always uh, tell when someone's nervous about a particular subject by the way they color their responses, especially if they present ego and they start to use sarcasm. And uh, it's a very revealing thing to show the insecurity of the individual. All right, those are your words. Now let's apply them to the following clip taken two hours and 12 minutes into the new Zeitgeist film. When we consider a resource-based economy, there are often a number of arguments that tend to come up with regard hey, to the efficiency. Hey, uh, hey, uh, now hold on just a minute. Yes. I know what this is. This is called Marxism, buddy. 
Stalin killed 800 billion people because of ideas like this. My father died, died in the this gulag. Is hold on, this hold on. Is communist, fascist. You don't like America, you should just leave. Everybody just calm down. And as the irrationality of the audience grew, shocked and confused, suddenly the narrator suffered a fatal heart attack. <laughs> And the seemingly communist propaganda film was no more. Now, if you watch this film, consider the context and take a second to ask yourself, what's hiding behind Peter's sarcasm in this scene? He's resorting to mockery and he's using it to avoid a very important question, control. In this future world that you claim is inevitable, all resources, all production, every square inch of what we currently think of as property would be controlled by a supercomputer. But who programs that computer? And who decides how that computer is programmed? Those people, whether you're willing to name them or not, will in fact be the ones who decide how resources are used. They will have the power of life and death over every person on this planet. And I know you hold out the hope that humans will evolve to a point where they can be trusted with such power. However, we can't count on what people may theoretically become someday. We have to deal with humans as they are right now. And right now, there's a certain percentage of humans that are drawn to power and will grab it if the chance arises. Now, I can imagine you responding by saying that a state of abundance would eliminate these tendencies. But if that's the case, I would challenge you to explain why the worst of these criminally insane men, which currently control our world, come from the world's richest families. To place all of humanity at the whims of a single system that could easily be seized by a determined maniac would be criminally negligent and utterly naive. You cannot stand before us and honestly promise that another Hitler-type individual will never be born on this planet again. You cannot control every parent, you cannot control every childhood, and you will never eliminate anomalies. Moreover, such a system would be the equivalent of monoculture farming. Planting all your fields with only one type of crop reduces biodiversity, and in the process creates a very fragile system. Economies, just like ecosystems, are much less likely to collapse entirely if there's variety. There's also another nagging problem. Your entire theory runs on the premise that you will eventually convert everybody to this way of thinking, or at least most of us. But the reality is, even a simple 51% majority is out of reach. There's whole sections of the planet who aren't interested and who'll never be interested, and who in fact will never be exposed to what you have to say. Will you send missionaries into Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Zimbabwe, and the Amazon like the Christians did? Anyone who's lived any period of time outside of our comfortable Western culture understands just how arrogant such a proposition sounds. If you did that, you would be no better than the rest of the European colonists who waltzed into countries that they didn't understand and then summarily destroyed their culture. And make no mistake, livelihood is part of culture. Land ownership is part of culture. I posted an official challenge to Peter Joseph on a separate video, demanding an explanation of how those who don't go along with this program will be dealt with if no force is going to be used. So far, I haven't gotten a real answer yet. In the meantime, I think we've established that the official resource-based economy as promoted in the Zeitgeist film, has real and legitimate problems. Those problems are not minor details that can be glossed over or fixed to a later date. They are, in fact, inherent design flaws, which render it unworkable. This is a response to the recent video released by the TZM official channel entitled RBE Concepts, Why We Are Not Building Cities. In their video, the TZM official channel spends some time going through a set of justifications for why they're not building cities or communities. I'm going to go through some of these and demonstrate why this position is unscientific and why it breeds distrust for their movement. In part two of the series, they state the following. There's a high chance that there will be scarcity in this scenario, which would not be a good representation of the Venus Project, since the aim of the Venus Project is to consider all the world's resources. As I've said before, the resource-based economy model right now is nothing more than a hypothesis. It has never been tested, and therefore there really is no proof whatsoever that it would work on any scale, much less a global scale. What you're proposing by insisting that we try this on a global level first is nothing short of taking an experimental medication and distributing it to the public at large without so much as seeing what it does to rats. That's not scientific, and it's dangerous. If you fail on a global scale, then the consequences will be global. Furthermore, it seems to me that the movement is more concerned about the damage to its image which may result from having a test case fail than it is in actually finding out what would actually work. Failure is a part of science. You should embrace it. It should be a clearly stated position of your movement that it will most assuredly fail in the first several attempts. Do you really think that Edison would have invented the light bulb if he had insisted on never making an attempt that went awry? Failure is how science discovers what doesn't work. And when you know one thing that doesn't work, you're that much closer to discovering an approach that will. I've heard their argument made that you guys need enough of the right kind of people thinking in the right way in order for the resource-based economy to work. But at the same time, you assert that it's this resource-based economy which will fix the fundamental human problems which would normally keep the resource-based economy from working. That sounds like circular logic to me. Any solution that's going to change the direction of society has to start with humans as they are right now. And quite frankly, if your solution doesn't handle people in their current state, 
then it's really not a solution at all. Now, I'm familiar with the typical rebuttals that technology is going to fix all this. But from my experience, having lived in communes and intentional communities, what makes or breaks a community is the human element. It's the decision-making process, the dispute resolution process, the rules and bylaws and how they're implemented. This is difficult stuff, and if you as a movement aren't able to demonstrate that you've mastered these principles in small groups in long-term living situations, then people like me who've actually participated in that kind of living environment are going to be very skeptical that you're capable of pulling it off. You need to remember that the burden of proof falls squarely on your shoulders. Those of us who are looking at this from the outside are not impressed with mock-ups or theoretical solutions. We want to see proof. And a lot of people are going to be a lot less polite than me if you don't provide it. On February 8, 2011, I received an email from YouTube informing me that two of my videos were taken down due to a DMCA copyright claim filed by Jacques Fresco and Roxanne Meadows. I immediately filed a counterclaim based on the fair use provisions of U.S. copyright law under 17 United States Code Section 107, which specifically states that the fair use of copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, and teaching is not an infringement of copyright. Now, my use of the video clips in question clearly fall within this description under critique, and my counterclaim was successful. The videos were reinstated by YouTube, and all strikes were removed from my account. Now, I took down a number of my previous videos attacking the Zeitgeist movement due to their aggressive nature and due to the way that they were polarizing the debate rather than encouraging real dialogue. However, I've decided to put one of the videos which were DMCA'd back online and it will stay online. I'm going to be linking to it below, and I encourage all of you to go watch it so you can place what I'm saying here into context. Now, I've waited some time so that I can make this video without anger, and I can assure you that this isn't personal, but it needs to be said. The Zeitgeist Movement advocates open information, free transfer of ideas, et cetera, et cetera, and in the perfect world, copyright law wouldn't exist, and I can dig that. However, if you decide to use the legal system to your benefit when you find it convenient, then you need to make sure that you're acting in accordance with the law. The practice of filing an unfounded DMCA claim in order to silence dissent is an abuse of the law. Roxanne Meadows, Jack Fresco, and Peter Joseph need to come to terms with this, and they need to acknowledge it publicly. And once that's done, there needs to be an official policy shift within the movement to make sure that this doesn't ever happen again. Because regardless of whether you see yourselves as leaders or not, you guys are the most influential individuals in the movement. And this kind of behavior sets a very, very bad example for the other members. A lot of you probably noticed I took down my series of videos attacking the Zeitgeist movement. And rather than sending out individual answers to each person who's written me asking why, I've decided to go ahead and address this in a public format. Now, before you go jumping to conclusions about what I'm going to say halfway through, I really hope you hear me out and listen to this whole video before commenting or blowing me off. This is definitely not the kind of video that I enjoy making, um, but I feel it would be cowardly and unethical for me not to. I made a video a while back entitled Recipe for a New Dark Age where I outlined what I felt was the most dangerous pattern of human society, the refusal to readjust one's perspective in the face of logic and evidence. You might want to watch that video as a point of reference and consider what I'm about to say is me voluntarily taking a dose of my own medicine. The first thing I'd like to qualify is that the concerns that I outlined in those videos regarding the Zeitgeist Movement are genuine, and they remain concerns for me. I would also state that I still disagree on a number of key tenets within the group, and I do feel very strongly that the Zeitgeist Movement needs to take these points into consideration or there may be unwanted consequences. That said, I realized last night in the middle of what ended up being a five-hour conversation with Neil Kierdman from V Radio that the way that I approached the discussion with the movement was counterproductive and even dangerous. And when I say dangerous, I mean literally. I was looking through the comments on my videos and this time looking at people who were on my side rather than just looking at my opponents. And I started to see people talking about going out and shooting Zeitgeist members or eradicating them before they had the chance to come to power. And I got this sinking feeling in my chest when I realized that I could be the inspiration for something like that. Any movement can be co-opted. Uh, the Tea Party is a standing example of this. And I do still see the possibility of the Zeitgeist movement being used by the real powers that be towards the implementation of the global government to be a real threat. However, if I want to bring awareness to these dangers, then it isn't very useful for me to turn the movement into an enemy, to polarize the population and reduce the discussion to a battle of wits, character attacks, and well-crafted mockery. By continuing down that route, I may have in fact participated in creating a new polarized paradigm similar to the current left-right paradigm, which is used to keep us divided right now, while the powers that be rob us all blind. We share a common enemy, and though we may never theoretically agree on specific ideas, if the movement can be held to testing principles on a small scale and adapting from the lessons learned, and I mean truly adapting as in radically changing course where evidence dictates, then I honestly feel that humanity might benefit from those experiments. There is one huge qualifier that I feel should be added here. The Zeitgeist Movement would be well served by letting go of the idea 
that they're going to make all other ways of life obsolete, especially in regards to private property and money. The principle of coexisting strategies should be a core and foundational principle, because without it, the non-aggression principle is easily put into doubt. I can envision a society where microcurrencies and trade systems live alongside open source public systems. And as long as a society like that was tempered with a realistic approach to the way humans are right now, rather than just expecting them to be better than they are right now, that is to say, we don't eliminate the checks and balances which protect us if things go wrong. And among those checks and balances would be a clear understanding of the boundaries of private property and free choice and that kind of thing. And I would actually probably be excited to see something like that tried, as long as it's done on a local level, not on a global level. Because from what I've seen, the larger human societies become the more distance they become from the decision-making mechanisms. And as that distance increases, the possibility, in fact, the probability of corruption also increases. I do plan on continuing the discussion on how we as a society should rebuild after the upcoming collapse, but rather than attacking a specific movement or a group of people, I'm going to put my attention on specific ideas, specific principles that need to be taken into consideration. Now, I will never let someone else think for me or take on their ideology as if it were my own, and I hope you don't either but it's foolish to discard entire blocks of ideas just because some of them need work. Uh, one thing I want to clarify is that my decision to take down these videos was not because of the DMCA claim filed by Jack Fresco, but actually in spite of it. I strongly believe that the use of DMCA copyright claims to get videos taken down is inappropriate. and It's not the way to deal with debate. However, what I realized is that these are two separate issues. They have their responsibility on the way that they deal with copyright issues and free speech but I have the responsibility to do what I think is right in regards to my videos. And that was a difficult conclusion to come to, but I think it's the only way to move forward in this kind of circumstance. Now, there's probably those of you who are going to unsubscribe because of this video, um, just as there are people who unsubscribe when I started making the videos attacking the Zeitgeist movement. That is, of course, your choice, um, but I hope you'll take this into consideration. If I were to refuse to shift my position when I feel in my heart that I've been going about things the wrong way, could I really be trusted? Even if I were to say exactly what you want to hear, if I walk away from my integrity, I would be nothing better than an ideological tool. And that's really not what I want.